Today's scripture reading God's Word, it is Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. This is what the Lord said, Israel King and Redeemer, and the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, apart from me, there is no God. Who then is like me? <coughs> Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let him foretell what will come. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this or foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. Go be it. Good morning. I'll start with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we do thank you so much that your ways are perfect and true and that you chose to love us, to create us, to worship you and adore you. You have done so many things that we should cry out. Lord, help us to open our hearts and mind to your spirit today, to your word. Sanctify us by your truth and your spirit that we may live a life that brings glory and honor to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So that song go good with our first day's theme of science and all that? Yeah? Did you listen to the lyrics? The first song we've done before, but the second song it was new to you. But I hope that you listen to those words because that's as rich of a song of praise that I've ever heard. A hundred, gal- hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath the planets form. Think about that. And we're going to talk more about God today as part two of who God is and His sovereignty and everything. And all of that goes down to the, to the point that it talks about Jesus. I mean, that's, that's what all of creation points to. That's what the Bible talks about, is that God loves you so much that He would send His Son to die for you. And if creation obeys you, we read it in the Scriptures, the winds and waves obey Jesus, demons obey Jesus, then are we obeying Jesus the way we should? God of salvation, you chased down my heart through all my failures and pride. Didn't matter what you've done or anything else. On a hill that you created, the light of the world came to die so that you could live. So who is God? We talked about Him last week. We talked about the God of the Old Testament compared to the God of the New Testament and so many times today in church... I take that with quotations because church is, again, God's people called out to proclaim His Word. But so much, many times in our acts of religion, I'll put it that way instead, we just talk about God is love, God is love. We don't talk about the sovereignty of God. We don't talk about the judgment of God. But that's just as much a fact of God, and it has to be, so that we know that when we go to heaven, we know that place that He's prepared for us will be perfect. There won't be any mistakes there or anything else. God is in sovereign control of all things. And see, the world, even in the church, teaches differently than that today. So much of the church teaches that God picks up the pieces and does good with them. No, God is in control of every single thing. And you have a choice whether you're going to obey Him or not. The rest of creation declares His name and does obey Him. Could you imagine if the laws that we know of, like the law of gravity or whatever, didn't obey God? (laughs) But see, they obey God because He is perfect. But He created us with a choice, and we have the choice. There will come a day, though, where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, period. So I choose to obey Him now. I choose to serve Him now. I choose to cry out now. God is Creator. He's powerful. He's Lord. He's Judge. He's merciful. He's holy. He's truth. He's faithful. He's gracious. And yeah, we talked about His sovereignty. 
We talked about Isaiah last week too and who Isaiah was and that he's quoted so much in the New Testament and Jesus is quoting him and John is quoting him in the very last words of Jesus' public ministry. Because in John chapter 13, it starts getting intimate with him giving instructions to the disciples. And we went over the fact that Jesus proclaimed that the scriptures did talk about him. In John chapter 4, Jesus says to the Samaritan woman when she's talking about worship and knows who the Messiah is, he says, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. He's clear about it. He is God himself. God who came in flesh and blood to live a life, to set an example, to teach, and to die for you. So that death has no power, that Satan has no power and dominion over you. That the time has come when you can reign as a child of the kingdom of God, if you so choose. In John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40, it says, You study the scriptures diligently, because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me and have life. Now I don't know how many times you refuse. I'll just go to myself instead. But I've refused that life so many times. I thought I knew what I was doing more than what God was doing. And I even fell captive to some of these lies that are out there, these deceptions out there that, that maybe God didn't know exactly what's going on so I call out to Him, why did you let this happen to me, Lord? When He knew exactly what was going to happen to me and He knew exactly why He was going to allow it to happen to me. And it happens because I rebelled against Him. But there will come a day when I will be redeemed for that. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, my faith in Him. Not by my works of righteousness, but by my faith in Jesus. But how can I not try to live a sanctified and holy life by the power of God inside of me again? The Old Testament saints did not experience this unless the Holy Spirit came upon them and then they proclaimed the Word of God. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us 24-7 to live the life that we cannot live on our own. In Luke 7, we read in verses 36 through 50 that there, was a, that there was a Pharisee that invited Jesus into his house. And the Pharisee said this, If this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And see, we still look at things that way. We all sin and all fall short of the glory of God. You're no better, no worse than anyone else. You have sinned, and sin is the problem, and Jesus Christ is the only answer. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. So, uh, <clears throat> Simon replied, I suppose, excuse me. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt was forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? She has worshipped me. That's what he's saying. She has done all these things for me. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. How does your love reflect what God has done for you? Look at creation. Look at history. Look at anything and everything you want to examine and you'll see a God of order and you'll see a God of love. You'll also see a God who has to judge, who is holy and righteous. <clears throat> in Luke 8 we read in, in verse 4, While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town to town, He told this parable, the parable of the farmer and the seed. A farmer, a sovereign God, went out to sow his seed and as he scattered the seed, some fell up along the path. It was trampled and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground. And when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, Whoever has ears, let them hear. His disciples asked him what the parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. 
But to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. <clears throat> and we've got a quote from Isaiah in there, Isaiah 6, 9. That you have had the message of God revealed to you. So even more as a child who has been instructed and then can still con continues to disobey, what does that say about that child? It's one thing not knowing right and wrong, but when you know right and wrong and you still continue on that path, what are you saying about the love of God who would give up His only child to save you? God is sovereign. He remains supreme over all. And we have sinned and we need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ the Lord. So I want to talk a little bit more about God's sovereignty today. And I want to go over the Scriptures that have got me to this point. John 12, 37 through 43. It says, Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in Him. How tragic is that? God crying out to them and they still wouldn't believe. So John writes, This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord who has believed our message, this message of truth, this message that the miracles attain to, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed, a quote to God's power that we see in all of creation and everything else. For this reason they could not believe. You may not like to think about that, but there comes a time when God quits calling your name. And if He quits calling your name, you can't come to Him. Now if you're a child, you're a child. You're still a child. Nothing can take that away from you. If you're not, though, you could have the life preserver pulled out from under you. If you are a child, what are you saying about the love of the Father through the Son if you're not willing to give Him your life and cry out? To worship Him. <clears throat> For this reason they could not believe, because as Isaiah says elsewhere, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah 6 verse 10 is where he's quoting. Isaiah saw this because he saw Jesus' glory. He saw all the truth, all of creation, all of history pointing to a Savior. Emmanuel, God with us, the one that they would call Jesus because He would save the people from their sins. The one that Jesus said, the Scriptures point to me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Yet, or but, at the same time, many among the leaders believed in Him. Oh, looks like a positive thing. But, we've got another in there because of the Pharisees, or whatever the reason that you have in your life of why you will not give Him 100% of your heart, 100% of your mind, your body, your soul. They would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. Back to Luke chapter 8, His disciples asked what that parable meant, that parable of the sower. And Jesus said in verse 10, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been revealed. That arm or power of the Lord has been revealed. There is no excuse. It's been revealed to everyone. But even more to the sons and daughters who have accepted and believed in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but to others I speak in parables, so that those seeing... They think they're wise, but yet they're foolish. They may not see what they see is a lie. Though hearing, they do not perceive and understand. Isaiah 6, 9. So we should go back to Isaiah 6, shouldn't we? Let's read a little bit more there. So I'm going to go back to Isaiah 6, starting in verse 1. And if you have an NIV version, it says Isaiah's commission there. Huh? That's Isaiah's commission, huh? Well, we got a great commission, don't we, for us too. So we, we've been commissioned. We've been called out. We have been given authority. We've been equipped. <clears throat> In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of His robe filled the temple. 
Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. Kind of reminds me of the song that we sang last, doesn't it? But it also reminds me of John's vision of things to come in Revelation. In Revelation 1, verses 1 and 2, John, the same author of the book of John, writes this, The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. If we drop down to verse 5, it says, From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, we can count on what he's saying. He says it in John chapter 12, and the Father verifies it with an audible voice from heaven. And he says at the end of the chapter that he speaks the words of God because God his Father sent him. And he won't judge, but there will be a day and there will be a judge. <clears throat> From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now remember that. He rules kings. Does he rule you and I? To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Woo! Let me read that one again. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve God and Father. That's what He's called us to do. To Him be all glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him. And all of the people of the earth will mourn because of Him, those who don't know Him intimately as Savior and Lord. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. If you skip to Revelation chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Also in front of the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were, co they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The, living, the first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third was, had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was, covering, and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Isaiah 6, 3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. This is the things that must happen so that we can spend eternity in heaven with Jesus our Savior, with God our Father. But yet we get distracted and we want to figure out when's this going to happen and how's it going to happen and is it pre or post or mid or, or what is it rather than we're focused on we have a mission and a task that we have a prize waiting for us. We have a race to run. That there's urgency because there are people out there that don't know about Jesus Christ and we have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. We have a message to proclaim to herald. We have been commissioned just as Isaiah was commissioned. So back to Isaiah 6 verse 4. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook. The temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. With, with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sins atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Now, if that coal from the altar cleansed Isaiah, how much more has the blood of Christ cleansed you to be called for the commission that you have? Think about it. And God is saying to you just the same, Whom will I send? To my workplace, to my Sunday school class, whatever it is. If He's calling you overseas to a foreign mission, whatever He's calling you to do, are you being obedient? Are you letting Him direct your steps? Are you looking for every opportunity to proclaim Jesus Christ? Isaiah said, Here am I, 
send me. <clears throat> Verse 9, he said, Go and tell this people, those stiff-necked people who continue to harden their own hearts and blind their own eyes, so that I might just use them for my glory in that way. Think about that. What are the saddest thing that you blind yourself enough and you harden yourself enough that God says, I'll use Pharaoh for my good. I'll bring glory and honor through him because of his refusal to come and worship me. Because all of creation will sing praises to God Almighty. They always have, they always will. And we're going to look at that a little further here. Go tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, I mean, ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Now, this is history now that we're looking at it in Isaiah, just like we're looking at history when Jesus went to the cross to die for your sins. If you look at history, not the Bible, you'll see that Israel went to be captives again because of their stiff necked belief in God, refusal to obey His commands and decrees that He set before them long ago after He delivered them again from bondage in Egypt and said, if you will worship me, I will bless you. Choose today what God you serve and whether you're choosing life or death, blessings or cursings. It's the same. There's no difference except that the, what cleansed you now is Jesus Christ, God's only Son. Wow. <clears throat> so back to John 12, 37, 43. Let's read it again, understanding that. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in Him. This was to fill the words of Isaiah the prophet who saw Jesus' glory, who knew who God was, who got a foretaste of it and said, I'll be your messenger no matter what it costs, even if it costs me to be sown in half. <clears throat> Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe. Because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn. That's all it would have taken. Turn. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves before me, turn from their wicked ways, I will heal them. They will soar like eagles. If He gives His Son to die for you, how much more does He want to bless you? If you will turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah saw, said this because he saw Jesus' glory, the glory of the Father in the Son. Wow. And he spoke about Him. Yet, at the same time, many leaders did believe in Him. But... Because of whatever reason, they refused to proclaim Him. For they loved human praise, human glory, the things of this world, the created things more than the Creator, more than God, more than a Father who passionately loves each and every one of us. So back in Luke... Chapter 8, and I know I'm going all over. I'm trying to tie it together so I don't want to lose you. <laughs> the disciples that had, had seen these miracles, that had saw the worship of the woman and everything, and then Jesus told them this parable about sowing seed. They said, what does this mean? His disciples asked him what this parable meant. Luke 8, verse 9. Now verse 10. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you. Do you realize that? The power that you hold in your hand. You have life or death, blessings or cursings from God given to you to proclaim to the world if you will simply proclaim it. 
equipped by the blood of Jesus Christ, who said, I won't leave you as orphans, I will send my spirit. The Old Testament law says that we can't adhere to the law. There's no way. We can't do it under our own power and might. We need a Savior. So God comes to us in the form of His Son and then doesn't leave us as orphans if we believe He sends His Spirit back to equip us for every work of righteousness. As long as we die to ourselves, deny ourselves, take up this cross, this, this burden that we have to carry, and proclaim, serve, follow after Jesus. And then we'll find out this cross, this burden, <laughs> was paid for at Calvary. It's really not that much of a burden at all because then we'll see the joy and peace that we have in Jesus Christ. And we'll see that His cross settled it all. <clears throat> but to others I speak in parables, so that through seeing they may not see, through hearing they may, though hearing they may not understand. Turn. Turn from your disbelief to belief, to true faith in Jesus Christ. Isaiah was commissioned, just as we are commissioned, to proclaim the word of Jesus Christ to a people who did not want to hear it. To a people that were living in the land of milk and honey and thought, hey, nothing can happen to us. Sounds a lot like us, doesn't it? And then God said, because of your stiff neck disbelief, when you think and say, oh, I believe, I believe, judgment is coming. But see, the judgment that comes when Jesus comes back, there won't be another cycle of it. There won't be any history to repeat it. When Jesus comes back, He will claim His bride. Are you part of that? Do you proclaim the love of Jesus Christ? <clears throat> if you read Isaiah chapter 53, you'll see all kind of references to this one who would be coming, who would be pierced for our transgressions, wound for our iniquities, who would bear all of our sin and shame. Could this be Jesus? So many people say no. So, so many scholars say, oh, Isaiah was not written by Isaiah because there's too much prophecy in it that's fulfilled. So it had to be written after the fact. But we've got documentation of scrolls and stuff dated back. That, that's not true. And you can believe whatever you want to believe. You can believe that a hundred billion stars doesn't even touch the limits of the stars that are out there. That our sun that gives us the life here on this planet is just insignificant in the scheme of things. And when Jesus spoke, as the song says, the vapor from His speaking formed these planets and stars. That same God loves you and is drawing you to Him. So it reminds me of what we read in John 12 earlier. When all of the world came to Jesus to see if He was this Messiah. And in verse 24, they're waiting and they're, they're listening for Jesus' words and He says this, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel, a single seed of wheat falls to the ground and dies. Don't forget the dies part. It doesn't matter if it falls to the ground and, and does not germinate. It's got to germinate. It's got to die to germinate. It remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Wait a minute. I thought about it as a harvest and everything, but it says seeds make seeds. Isn't that kind of like the Great Commission again? To go and make disciples? Teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. How are you going to teach your kids to obey everything that Jesus has commanded if you're not trying to follow them yourself? If you don't realize how big God is, how sovereign He is, and how much He loves you. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, you don't have to worry about it, <clears throat> my servant also will be. I'm with you, you're with me. That's the way it works. My Father will honor, glorify the one who serves me. 
So grab your Bibles. Turn to Isaiah 43. We're going to look at more of Isaiah to see this. And I'm going to go through it quickly as possible without mind-boggling you, because I want to hit two full chapters <laughs> to show you the miraculous things that Isaiah foretold so that you can see why John and Jesus are quoting Isaiah here. They're pleading to the people of Israel, believe that Jesus is the promised one, that He is the Messiah. Jesus even hides Himself signifying that, that the light would disappear at some point. So we need to grab on to the light now so that we can be children of light. So in Isaiah 43, in verse 1, if you've got an NIV, it's got a caption again, Israel's only Savior. Let us learn from history. There is no other Savior. That's why God told them to drive out the the foreign gods from their land and everything, and to worship only Him and everything else, and set up all this law which they cannot follow. So then He says, I'll do it for you. I'll send a Messiah. I'll send a Savior. So starting with verse 1, it says, But now this is what the Lord says, He who created Jacob, He who formed you Israel. Now I want to read this a little differently, and I want you to read it a little differently. Okay, Put your name in where I'm going to put my name. How's that? Okay? So verse 1, but now this is what the Lord says. He cre who created Alan, he who formed Alan, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you, Alan, by your name. You are mine, Alan. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Alan. I am your Savior. I gave Egypt for a ransom. I even gave my son for a ransom. <clears throat> Drop down to verse 4. I will give people in exchange for Alan, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, Alan, for I am with you, Alan. I will bring Alan's children from the east and gather you from the west. Wow, it sounds a little bit better when it's personal, doesn't it? And it does apply to us just as much today as it did then. Oh, it applies even more because we're not talking to a nation now. We're talking independently to the children of God who have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them if they believe in what Jesus Christ said and did. <clears throat> Verse 7. Everyone, including Alan, who is called by my name, who I created, Alan again, for my glory whom I formed and made, Alan. Lead out those who have eyes but are blind. Huh, we got a pattern here, don't we? And have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together and the people assemble. Which of their gods foretold this? Can you name any? <clears throat> Which of their gods foretold this and proclaimed to Alan the former things? Let them bring in their witnesses to prove they were right, so that others may hear and say, It is true. You, Alan, are my witness, declares the Lord, and Alan, you are my servant, whom I have chosen, so that Alan may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior." I have, what's that word? Revealed is what the NIV uses. The arm of the Lord has been revealed, <laughs> right? And saved as a result, if you believe, and then proclaimed, and I'm proclaiming through you. You are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. You are the salt, the preservative, and the flavor for the world. You are the light. You shouldn't hide your light, but you post it up for everyone to see. <clears throat> and not some foreign God among you. So live as children of light, right? You, Alan, are my witness. And so, that's plural, and so are you and you and you and you. The church, the body of Christ, declares the Lord that I am God. We are witnesses of a sovereign, amazing, loving God who would give His Son to die for us. Verse 18, Forget about the former things. Don't be deceived and entrapped in this world and what you were pursuing. Do not dwell on the past, Alan. See, I am doing a new thing. Jesus Christ, you, and the rest of the believers 
united together by the Spirit to proclaim the Word of God, the church called out. Now it springs up. Do you, Alan, not perceive it? The people I formed, including you, Alan, for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Yet you have not called, me, called on me, Alan. I'm, I'm going to change that one. I have called on him. Because I turned. Got to get it. See, you don't have to be there. You don't have to be stiff-necked. You can turn. And that's what Jesus was saying as his last cries. You can turn. You can believe in me. And you can be saved. You can have abundant life like you never thought you could have. You can have power over sin and worry and doubt and anything else in your life that's keeping you captive. I, verse 25, even I am he who blots out your sins, Alan, your transgressions, for my own sake, for my own glory, and remembers, Alan, I don't remember your sins anymore. Review the past for me. Let us argue the matter together. State the case, Alan, for your innocence. <laughs> I'm not, I'm guilty. I need a Savior. Verse 28, the second part. I consigned Alan to destruction and Alan to scorn. Nope, because I turned. Turn the page to Isaiah 44. And if yours is an NIV again, it has a captain, Israel the Chosen. See, God has called me by name. He wants me. He wants me to experience the life that I was created to live. He wants me to recognize the precious position I am as a child of God through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So starting in verse 1, But now listen, Alan, my servant, Alan, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says. He who made Alan, who formed Alan in the womb, and who will help Alan. Do not be afraid, Alan, my servant. I will pour out my spirit, I'm on verse 3, on your offspring. Oh, what a release that is. I don't have to even worry about my children. If I train them up in the ways of the Lord, they will not depart from it because my God is faithful even when I'm unfaithful. So you better believe I'm going to hold on to that and train them up. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. If you look at the next caption, if you have an NIV, it says, just prior to verse 6, it says, The Lord, not idols, reminding us again, there's only one God. The rest are all created things. So why not worship the Creator? Verse 6, This is what the Lord says to Alan, his King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my people and what is yet to come. Huh. A God who's in control of the past, present, and future. Everything. Now I know some of you probably still thinking, I don't know if I believe that or not. And we'll probably even talk more about this to show you God's sovereignty. But He's in control of everything. So when something happens to you that you don't think you can walk through, first of all, Jesus Christ went through it and died so that you could have abundant life, that you could have peace and joy. And second of all, God knows it and has a plan in it. It's not happenstance. He doesn't pick up the pieces. He is sovereign. Again, I've given an example, but I'll give it again. I'll let my child fall off the deck so that they don't run out in a car next week so they learn to listen to me because I have that much ability in my mind to think. But God is sovereign. Anything and everything that happens to you, He knows about it and He cares about it. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 8, do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? Alan, you are my witness, and the rest of the church is my witness. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. Verse 9, all who make idols are nothing, and the things they treasure are worthless. 
How much do we read in the New Testament about living a life of worth instead of a life of worthlessness? Because we still hold on to the things of this world after Jesus has poured out His heart, poured out His ministry, so that we'll follow, follow after Him, forsaking everything else. Verse 15, But He also fashions a God and worships it. I'm skipping down for time, but what we do is we take the things that are created. We take the wood and we heat our homes with it. We take the wood and build a fire and cook our food with it. But we also take the wood, the things, and we still do it today. We don't make the images that we put over in the corner and worship it, but we do worship it because we live for those things rather than living for Christ. And there's nothing wrong with having things as long as you realize the God who gave it and used it to His glory. Remember when we talked about the rich man who had crops that were, and he said, I'll build bigger barns, I'll, 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 rather than giving God the glory and saying, what would you have me do with this to bring glory and honor to you? Because he's the one that owns all the cattle on all of the hills. But he also fashions a God and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Verse 17, from the rest, he makes a God his idol. He bows down to it and worships. He prays to it and even says, save me. Okay, now we're getting even deeper. If I just had more money, if I just was healthier, if I just had more prestige, more children, more of whatever it is, guess what? You will never be satisfied with more of any of a created thing. The only thing you're going to be satisfied with is more the Creator. <clears throat> you are my God. Don't miss this next verse. They know nothing. They understand nothing. Why? Because they caused it themselves. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see. And their minds closed so they cannot understand. Hmm, we're hearing it again, aren't we? No one stops to think. No one has knowledge or understanding to say, half of, the, half of it I use for fuel. I even baked bread on its coals. I roasted meat and I ate. Shall I make a detestable thing of what's left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? Maybe that'll give you a new perspective. That new car, that promotion, that whatever it is, is a block of wood. Serve the living God. The God who judges, the God who loves. The God who calls you to be His child. <clears throat> Verse 20, such a person feeds on ashes. That doesn't sound very healthy, does it? A deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say... Is not this thing in my right hand a lie? Remember these things, Alan, for you, Alan, are my servant. I have made you, Alan. You are my servant, Alan. I will not forget you, Alan. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud through the blood of my precious son. Your sins, like the morning mist, they just evaporate and are gone. All gone. Cast as far as the east from the west. Return to me. So he's not just saying this to those who don't know and understand, but he's also saying this to the ones who know and understand but turn from him. A couple weeks ago, Merle read from Revelation where Jesus says, Please come back to me. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and will let me back in, wherever you shut me out from, I will come and eat with them, which is intimacy with them. Come in and fellowship with them. <clears throat> Return to me, for I have redeemed you, Alan. Sing for joy, you heavens, for the Lord has done this. Shout aloud, you, you earth beneath. Burst into song, you mountains, you forests, and all you trees. <laughs> That's what we sang about this morning, wasn't it? For the Lord has redeemed Alan. He displays his glory in Alan. So if the rocks cry out, if creation cries out, if the sea cries out, so will I, right? Verse 24, this is what the Lord says to you, Alan, your Redeemer, who formed you, Alan, in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself, who foils the signs of false prophets and makes 
fools of diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense. If you're following in Corinthians, boy, that hits the nail on the head of what Paul's trying to tell that church, doesn't it? Who carries out the words of his servant and fulfills the predictions of his messengers. So what did Isaiah predict? Well, we're going to read on and see. Who says of Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited of the towns of Judah. We've got restoration proclaimed by Isaiah. They shall be rebuilt, and of their ruins I will restore them. Who says to the watery deep, be dry, and I will dry up your streams. Who says of Cyrus? So now we've got the Israelites who wouldn't turn, who went into Babylonian captivity. We've got the story of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I think I said that one right. They said, we won't bow down to anybody else. And now we've got a ruler from history, a mighty ruler named Cyrus the Great, if you're not familiar with him. In 539 B.C., he overthrew the Babylonian Empire and he commissioned Jerusalem to be rebuilt. And there's more to that story because they still didn't even, even do it then. They were still stiff-necked. But it says right here, Isaiah says, and Isaiah was written, oh, 150 years before Cyrus the Great. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd? What? He will shepherd his people? A foreign king? A pagan? I will still use him to bring glory and honor to me even if he won't bow down to me. Because I formed him just the same and I have plans for him, but he refused to listen. And I'm still going to use him just as I have used Pharaoh, just as I will use Judas, and I hope and pray that he doesn't use you in that way. I hope he praises you to proclaim his name because of your obedience, not your disobedience. He who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. No mistakes about it. I am in control from beginning to end forevermore. I reign supreme. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. And then if we turn over to Isaiah 45, verse 1, it says, this is what the Lord says to His anointed. Whoa, wait a minute. That means set apart to be made holy. And yet He's referring to Cyrus. This is what the Lord said to His anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before Him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before Him, so that gates will not be shut. If you study history, you'll know that Cyrus the Great conquered pretty much the known world before the Romans came in who had Israel in captivity and submission again, right? So that Jesus would save them, but because they didn't see the physical release from the Roman Empire, they said, this can't be the Messiah. Despite all the signs and things He's done, we know He's from God, but He can't be the one. In fact, we need to crucify Him because he says he's God. How blasphemous is that? But all we've got to do is look at history and say everything points to Jesus Christ and God's love for you. The words of Isaiah are a stumbling block to some. Like I said, some people say, oh, he had to write it after the fact. But as we discover more and more Dead Sea Scrolls and things of that nature, we say, oh, wait a minute. Here's a copy that dates back here and it says the same thing again. How did, he get, how did that stuff get written before it happened? except that God will use Cyrus as his anointed and his shepherd and will accomplish all that he pleases. He doesn't pick up the pieces. He's in total control all the time. But you have a choice in whether you will follow him and worship him or not. That's the difference in us and the rocks and the sea and the animals is we have a choice. And boy, does that choice matter because that choice is written in red written in the blood of Jesus Christ. Same God then, same God now. And Jesus is saying that in John 12, crying out, even taking the light away from them, begging and pleading with them to accept Him, to put their faith and trust in Him. And that's what He's still doing today. He's still crying out to each and every one of us, including Alan, to follow after Him, 
to experience peace in life and joy. To live a life of worth. To be obedient. To accomplish the things the Father has done through submission as His humble servant rather than as one who opposes Him because He'll still accomplish what He desires to accomplish. So I hope and pray that you see from history, that you see from creation, that you see from everything a sovereign God who then you can apply John 3.16 to who loves you so much that He would give His only Son for you. So that you can sing and cry out these praises that you can tell other people about Him. Next week we have a chance to do that to the church, to those called out, because we'll be meeting afterwards for those that will come 11.30 11.30 at the fairgrounds for community worship. I don't know who will be there anything else. But whoever's there is meant to be there. And we have an opportunity to cry out unity and the love of Christ to one another. So I hope you can do that. Bring food. It is a potluck. And remember, we won't have Sunday school because it falls during Sunday school time. So we'll talk more about this sovereign God and everything. We'll give you some more examples. But you know, even history won't make the deciding factor for you. If you saw the Lee Strobal movie that we went to as a church to see, Case for Faith, he had everything laid out in front of him. And he said, there's no way I can dismiss this resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if I can prove that that didn't happen, then it all falls apart. And everything that he researched pointed him to the truth, but he still refused to believe it. But his wife was faithful, continued to love him, continued to pray for him, and God opened his eyes so that he could see. Father in heaven, we thank you so much and praise you for all that you do, that you are sovereign in all things. For those that are hurting, for those that are doubting, Lord, bring them peace, bring them joy. Give them knowledge. Reveal yourself to them so they can see your love through Jesus Christ, your Son. And may we proclaim you boldly to a world who is lost, who needs saving. May not even know it, may not care, but may we proclaim the word boldly as the first church prayed for when they saw persecution. They didn't pray that the persecution would be gone. They prayed that they could proclaim the word of God even more boldly. Give us urgency, Lord. Help us to see through the eyes of Jesus the love of God the Father through the Son. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.